Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Psychology of Spirituality. We're going to be doing part two of our conversation with Johan D'Souza, leaving off from last week. Just wanted to do a quick summary on some of the things that he'll be speaking about, dealing with the philosophy of Aristotle. Just give us a good foundation before we go into the conversation. Let's go right ahead. As the successor of Socrates and Plato, Aristotle was the last of the great Greek philosophers, regarded as perhaps his greatest work, the Nicomachean Ethics, had to deal with achieving happiness through the attainment of virtues. Aristotle comes to understand virtue as a state between the extremes of excess and deficiency. In this work, Aristotle lays out the foundation for how to achieve high virtue through moral education, through the doctrine of the means, through the unity of the virtues, through the importance of friendships, and through the attainment of happiness. And finally, Aristotle concludes that contemplation is the highest human activity as it extols wisdom at its highest peak. The activity of wisdom is contemplation, so contemplation must be the highest activity of human life, according to Aristotle. And that was just a really quick summary, but that last point I think is really important to mention, the importance of contemplation and you know we see this through spiritual practices that emphasize submission that emphasize self-reflection that emphasize contemplation of the deepest manner to reach some sort of divine truth to reach nirvana as the buddhist would say to reach divinity as some sufis would say but the extolment of contemplation is a very important virtue that we as humans and, and psychologically speaking also can perfect and fine-tune as we go about our life. Now let's go into our conversation with Johan. Here on Psychology Spirituality we also like to speak about people's spiritual experiences and how they find spirituality and meaning in their life. So Johan has a bachelor's in theology this is how we came to talk to one another, just talking about our own experiences. So I wanted to ask Johan, what does spirituality mean to you? Thank you, Saeed. So what is spirituality? There's different ways to approach that question. And I'm going to take it from more of a psychological, philosophical perspective rather than a religious perspective. Although I think that is one valid way to approach the question as well. So from the psychological, philosophical perspective, Spirituality, as I see it, is the life in a person of the spirit. So what is the spirit? The spirit is what separates us from all other forms of life and even all other forms of physical creation. It's the non-material aspect of our being. So what do I mean by that? What separates us from rocks, from just purely physical things that have chemical properties, physical properties. What separates us from even plants that have biological properties? Just like we do. We, we take in nutrition, we grow, we develop. Furthermore, what separates us from animals? Now, what do we share in common with animals? Well, the life of the senses. The ability to know the environment through our senses through feeling, through listening, through sight, to experience fear as a result of that interaction with the environment, or to experience pleasure, to seek for food and take pleasure from that, to experience all the emotions. We share these in an analogous way with animals. So what separates us from all those things? And that is what the spirit is. What is that? It's will, free will, free voluntary acts. It's intelligence. And I'll take each of these separately. So free will, it's the topic that's debated among philosophers, but there's no reasonable person who can live as though he does not have free will. And every human culture throughout all of history has taken it as a common custom to presume the existence of free will, even if they don't discuss it philosophically. And how do you know that? You know that because 
every human culture has a custom of assigning praise or blame to various actions. We praise things that are good. We blame things that are evil. And that would only make sense if one is seen as freely choosing those acts. We don't assign praise or blame to rocks or to plants or even to animals, except maybe in an analogous sense. Rather, we're more prone to deal with animals in a, in a violent way if they attack people. We, we put them to sleep immediately if it seems like a very ferocious animal. In an analogous way, we sometimes treat them with praise or, or blame. But properly speaking, this is only a characteristic that we apply to agents that have free will. So that's one aspect of the spirit, is the ability to, fruit, to choose freely. And I'll get into why that's important later. But first I'd like to touch on the second aspect, which is intelligence, or the ability to reason. So what does that mean? The ability to reason means three things. The first is the ability to form concepts, universal ideas. And we represent these concepts with signs that we call words. So the ability to say that that is a dog, and that's a universal idea that is applicable to every single dog, even a dog that we've never seen before, a type of dog we've never seen before, uh, even uh, an imaginary dog like uh, Clifford the Big Red Dog, which is not even physically possible in reality, but we, we know that that is a dog. And it's simply astounding that humans have that ability from a very, very young age. If, if anyone has raised children and seen them go through that transition into speaking, they're just utterly astounded by it. Uh, it's a capability that is within us that is brought out through, through interaction with other people, but that capability is innate within us. The second, the second power of reason is a judgment. Judgment involves using concepts, words, together in a sentence. So to say that, the traditional example, Socrates is a man, or even better, all men are mortal. That means you have to know two things. You have to know two concepts, the concept of men and the concept of mortal. And when I say concept, how do we know the concept? We're striking at the very essence of what the thing is. If you know the essence of a man, or the essence of mortal, what it means to be that thing, then you know that all men are mortal. And we're doing more than just identifying concepts, we're joining those concepts together in a sentence, in a proposition, to form a judgment that all men are mortal. That's the second power of reason, the second power of the, intel into the intelli intelligence that separates us from animals. The third power is the power of argument. And this is joining sentences together in order to form one complete argument. And this could be in an essay, like a paragraph, or uh, more simply and clearly in what's known in logic as a syllogism. A syllogism traditionally has three sentences, three claims. And a classic syllogism is Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal. So combining, including those concepts to form a judgment, combining those series of judgments to form an argument. So those are uniquely human abilities. Now, why do I bring that up in the concept of spirituality? Because to live the life of the spirit is to use these spiritual abilities, to use your will to freely choose to act in accord with your intelligence, in accord with your reason. And that's what makes us spiritual beings. That's what makes us good people or bad people to the extent that we use our will to act in accord with our reason. And if over time we freely choose acts that are in, in accord with reason, we develop a habit. And that habit 
is known as a virtue, a good habit of the soul. In behavioral psychology, we call those values or ideals, and we define it by saying a guide for personal action that you can never fully achieve. And if you think whatever you put into that definition, a guide for personal action you can never fully achieve, it's going to be a good value. And uh, I encourage you to think about what are some guides for your own personal action that you can never fully achieve. So I say never fully achieve to distinguish it from a goal. So one can achieve a goal of running um, a race in a certain amount of time, but one can never fully achieve the goal of having, let's say, uh, perfect self-control. It's something that we always strive to improve on. Uh, so in the philosophical literature, virtue is defined by stable, active disposition of the soul by which one is inclined to freely choose the good, knowingly and for its own sake. And I'd be happy to break that down before the interest of time. Maybe I'll leave it at that for now. So these good habits, these are expressed in four fundamental ways. Uh, the first is good judgment. That's also known as prudence. The second is self-control, also known as temperance. And that means knowing how to regulate oneself with regard to pleasure, not taking too much of something that's pleasant and not abstaining too much from something that's pleasant. And the third is fortitude, or in the psychological literature, it's known as grit. And one, one kind of a very beautiful example of fortitude is fearlessness in the face of a noble death. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine someone giving his life for his friend, giving his life for his family, or giving his life for a country. And even though being alive is a great good, and no one would, no one would give that up, no reasonable person would give that up for no, for no good reason, in order to, to give that up for the sake of something even better, the preservation of one's family or one's country, that's a very noble act which takes a lot of fortitude or courage. Yeah. And then the final fundamental, uh, you could call it family of virtues, is justice. Justice is giving to each person what is due to that person. Or you could say being fair. So just to uh, particularize these kind of abstract concepts, you may say, well, how, how is that relevant? And these are very relevant on a very practical level. Uh, for instance, one of the leading causes of preventable death in the US, maybe even the leading cause, is heart disease. Um, and how does that come about? Well, there's uh, many different factors, but a common factor is simply um, bad diet, bad exercise, right? Bad diet, people are obese because they consume too much, of, too much of what is pleasant. They're not able to regulate themselves with regards to what is pleasant. They know that they shouldn't be consuming this, but they do it anyways because it tastes good. Yeah. Well, again, taste is one of those things that we hold in common with animals. It, if you give an animal a tasty thing, it will eat it, and it will eat it until it's obese. And it may even die as a result of that over time. So how can we use our spirit to transcend those animal desires? How can we use our spirit to abstain from pursuing what's pleasurable? And not just because it leads us to greater health, which it will, but because it's, it's a beautiful, noble thing to do, to have intelligent self-control. And you can give examples, so on with the other virtues. Another example, fortitude, if you look at the psychological literature on grit, uh, it, in the literature it is shown as associated with academic performance, for instance. Uh, even people who are able to tough it out, to delay gratification, that is a, a really important characteristic for, for future success academically and professionally. So, that's why, in summary, what I would say that, for me, the spirituality 
is using your in intellect and free will to build good habits of virtue.